Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Ken Raggio Live. This is Ken Raggio, and I thank you for joining me today. Please like, comment, share, subscribe, and click notifications so you get notices each time we post a new video. My subject tonight is very simple. It's only two words. Bad news. Yes, I said it. Tonight's subject is bad news. You can guess what it is. If you want to go to the field of domestic politics, there's lots of bad news in domestic politics. Our president and Congress are in, as it were, a civil war. We have literal chaos in our congressional halls. The House of Representatives who are, by definition, the lawmakers of our land are breaking laws every day. And they are holding conservatives in contempt for refusing to break the law at their demand. We've got more trouble in the United States politics than we've ever had. This country is in grave danger. We have socialists and Muslims doing everything in their power to destroy our constitutional republic and turn this either into a socialist state or a Sharia-controlled Islamic state. This is no patty cake game we're looking at. This is serious business. This is bad news. And the international scene is not much different because overseas we're watching Europe disintegrate as Islamists are moving in, immigrating into the European countries and taking them over. We're watching the Middle East on fire because right now there's a great war. In fact, in today's news, the United States just shot down or just destroyed an Iranian drone. Now, you know that only a couple of weeks ago, the Iranians brought down one of our drones, and now we brought down one of their drones. So I guess you could say that's tit for tat, or that's fair enough. But it doesn't speak well for what we're about to see because there is a great, great conflict brewing, and uh, it's bad news. Israel is right now facing some of the greatest hostilities in its entire history, especially in its modern history. Now, if you know the history of Israel in modern times, you know that in 1948, in May of 1948, when this nation was born, called the State of Israel, Within the first 24 hours of, after having declared its Declaration of Independence, the Arab League went to war against Israel. Five Arab nations declared war on Israel, and Israel won. A nation that was less than 24 hours old whipped five nations on the day of its Declaration of Independence. And then they came back around in 1967 and declared another war on Israel. And Israel won the West Bank and East Jerusalem in those days. And they won uh, the Gaza Strip and the Golan Heights. And then in the Yom Kippur War, another major war. And now we're looking at uh, another major conflict. And part of this is uh, Iranian, part of it's Turkish, part of it's PLO, part of it's Hamas, part of it's Hezbollah, and all kinds of terrorists. But in Israel, there is so much bad news. The Israeli public has been forced into another election. We know that in November of last year, the government coalition fell apart. Netanyahu lost his majority in the Knesset, and they were forced to go to the polls in April. In, during which they re-elected Netanyahu, and he was unable to form another conservative coalition. He had to have 61 seats out of 120. He couldn't do it. So now they've gone. Uh, they had to disintegrate, the, uh, dissolve the Knesset, Knesset, and now they're having another election in September. And there's so much going on, and, and you see a whole lot of the very same hostilities in the political arena in Israel that you do in the United States. The wild-eyed left, and you've got Arabs and Muslims and liberals and leftists and LGBT and every kind of left-leaning liberal uh, contesting the conservative position. In fact, uh, Israel has been led now for 
uh, this Saturday, which is only two days from now, Benjamin Netanyahu will go on record as the longest standing president in Israel's modern history. He will outlast even David Ben-Gurion, who was the founding uh, president of Israel, prime minister of Israel. And so Netanyahu has done amazing things in his tenure. I was in Israel in 1996 when he was first campaigning for office, and I uh, saw him win that election, and we've seen him. Uh, he was voted out one term, and then he came back, and he's been in term for close to, uh, I don't know, probably close to 20 years. I forget exactly how many years he's been in office now, but at any rate, they're trying to take him down, and there's a lot of nasty charges being made against him. There's charges of corruption and so on and so forth. And we don't know how that's all going to turn off. But at the same time, while Israel's domestic politics is in grave turmoil, that's bad news. So is the Middle East peace plan. We know that uh, just recently the Trump administration began to unveil what was called the deal of the century just a couple of weeks ago in Bahrain. Jason Greenblatt and Jared Kushner made their presentation to a group of world leaders uh, consisting of mainly some of the uh, willing and cooperative Arab states in that region of the world. We saw the World Bank represented there in the IMF. We saw Tony Blair of Britain. We saw several other nations that are in support of this endeavor. And we have seen how the Palestinians, the Arab world, the Muslim world has very largely utterly rejected this so-called deal of the century and they haven't even introduced the p political aspect of it yet and that's bad news we got a lot of bad news and i could spend another hour if i wanted to and i've chosen not to go into a lot of headlines here tonight for a reason and because what i want to talk to you about is not so much the headlines as it is shall i say a question where do we go from here i have followed international events now f since I was a young man and I've preached and taught on Bible prophecies for just about as long as I can remember and uh, I have to tell you uh, something very candidly when I watch what's going on in the world today it is supremely distressing you know there's been a couple of times in my life or actually there's been several times in my life when I have had to observe someone that I knew or loved uh, when they went into a period of mental instability. I know that when my wife was suffering with cancer several years ago, uh, some of the medication they gave her was, uh, was not working really right and she began to hallucinate. And it's one of the most distressing things that you'll ever experience is when someone you love begins to talk out of their head and begin to say things and you, you really get concerned and worried about it and then many of you I'm sure have experienced that with Alzheimer's patients and people other people have various kinds of dementia and mental disorders it's it's a very it's a very distressing situation when someone's mind begins to malfunction and that's kind of the way I feel now when I listen to the news about the way my government's function because when I hear all of the insanity and I do mean insanity and I can't I'll say it a thousand times if I have to our Congress, our House of Representatives has gone insane. The people, Nancy Pelosi and the four uh, Muslim socialists, uh, so-called heroes on that part, are absolutely destroying our country with their nasty, insane rhetoric. And it's not going to get better. It's bad news. Now, you can say, well, we'll vote some of these people out. Well, I got news for you. We got about 40 other major islamic and socialist candidates running on the next ticket and we're going to see more and not less of this kind of trouble in the future and that is bad news and i can tell you just quite frankly i wish it wasn't that way I, <laughs> i'm i'm not the smartest man on earth but i'm not the stupidest guy either and i like to be able to talk sense with people. I, I like to have a reasonable conversation with people about the facts, about the way things are. And when I see the state of our society today, and I see the civil discourse, how it has been so corrupted and polluted 
with with uh, socially destructive narratives. I have to tell you, it it ma- it unnerves me. It makes me very very uh, uncomfortable to know that my government is being run by the equivalent of lunatics. Now, there's there's certainly plenty of people in Washington that have got a good mind and have good got a good value system and that love our country and that have the interest of American people at, at heart. But there's there's an increasing number of people who are are full of corruption. They have they have damnable ideologies at heart. They don't like our constitutional republic. They want to introduce socialism and Islam into our system and they want to take down our capitalistic democratic republic. And that is very, very disturbing. That's bad news to me. And I don't know how I don't know how that affects you. But having followed the news as closely as I have for many decades, I've reached a point where I can't hardly stand to watch the news anymore. Can't hardly stand to read what's going on because it is so disturbing when I realize that our country is literally spinning out of control. And I've I've put a lot of confidence and, and I've had a lot of hopeful thoughts about Donald Trump's abilities to turn this thing back toward a law and order government, but I see that they that the uh, that the New World Order, the Big Brother, all these people, you know what I'm talking about. These people are ramping up their opposition. And I'm going to tell you what, there's a word that really explains what's happening in all the world. One single word, and it's called siege. It's called siege. When an army lays siege to a city, it surrounds it. It encompasses it. It cuts it off. Every year we go to Israel, we take our tour group down to a place called Masada. And those of you who have been to Masada, you know it's a very poignant uh, place to go to because when you, when you get there, they tell you about the Jews who fled the Romans back in 70 AD. When, when the Romans, under Titus, the general, who was the son of Vespasian, the Caesar of Rome, when he came to Jerusalem in 70 AD to destroy the city and to, to kill off the Jews, there was about 900 of those Jews that fled down south of the Dead Sea to a mountain called Masada. And there was a fortress that had been built by King Herod years earlier. And Herod had lived there. It was, I uh, suppose, his, his uh, winter palace. But on the top of that mountain, he had an entire village, as it were. And it had been, uh, I suppose, abandoned. And the 900 refugees who had fled Jerusalem took over that mountaintop and that is where they intended to survive from the death efforts of the Romans in those days and they lived I think it was I forget now it's like it was like 30 or 40 years they lived on top of that mountain but the day came when the Romans sent armies down to the Dead Sea region and they laid siege to Masada and when you go to Masada now, you ride a cable car up to the top of the mountain, and from the top of the mountain, you can look into, and, and here it is 2,000 years later nearly, and you can, still the, you can still see where the Romans' encampments were down below the mountain. At the bottom of the mountain, there was tens of thousands of soldiers, Roman soldiers, that had uh, built their camps down there and determined they were going to conquer those Jews that were on top of Masada. And it took many years. And on the... I guess it's on the west side of the mountain there is a huge earthen ramp. And this mountain is, I think it's a couple of thousand feet high. And it's not accessible ordinarily. It's a, it's a hard climb. It's a very difficult place to uh, reach the summit. And so over a period of several years, the Romans literally hauled dirt in and they built another mountain along the side of Masada so that they could ascend that mountain on that ramp. And they spent years building that ramp, and those Jews who lived on top of that, uh, they knew that their, their, their days were coming to an end. And the story, as the story goes, the men of the community on top of the mountain met together, and they decided that they came up with a scheme where uh, each man would... Uh, to prevent their wives from being 
raped and plundered and to prevent their children from being raped and plundered and hauled off as slaves and to prevent their young men from being Roman slaves. They said they would not surrender to to slavery. They would not surrender to uh, sexual slavery or any of those things. And so they decided that each head of each household would kill off his wife and children. And then the men uh, would gradually kill one another off until the last man standing and the last man standing would kill himself. It's a very poignant story, very tragic story, very sad story. And of course, there's the morality of it all is is for all practical purposes beside the point because that's what they did. Whether it was right or wrong uh, is another is another conversation. But that's what happened because they became hopeless knowing that their days were numbered and that at any moment the Romans were going to descend that mount and capture them and take them back to Rome. And so as the story goes, when the soldiers finally got to the top of Masada, they found that all the Jews there were dead. Now that's what I'm talking about a siege. A siege is when you have been completely surrounded by enemies. So, uh, I think it would be fair enough to say that a siege is very bad news. If you, whatever town you live in, whatever city you live in, if you knew that enemy forces had come and laid siege to your city and that they had the ability to stay there indefinitely and that they cut off water and food supplies they cut off power supplies and that you had been left uh, without any resources that'd be a pretty terrifying circumstance to know that you had been laid siege to i'm going to tell you something about bible prophecies and our immediate destiny here's here's the here's the bad news and i want you to understand that i have to say these things because I'm a slave as a preacher of the gospel, having been called of God as a young man to preach the gospel, to preach the Bible. I consider myself to be a slave to the Bible. I, I consider that when I open up my mouth to preach the word, I am liable to God. I am responsible to God. I am duty bound to Jesus Christ to tell you exactly what the Bible says and not to alter the word of God in any form or fashion. I have to tell you what the Bible says. I have to tell you what thus saith the Lord. The prophecies of the Bible tell us where we are and tell us where we're headed. And here's where we're headed. Jesus said, when you see these signs, go to the 24th chapter of Matthew and read it for yourself. When you see the signs of the last days begin to be fulfilled. He talked about great deceptions in the church. He said, evil men and seducers. We're going to wax worse and worse. Paul said that. Evil men and seducers are wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Uh, Paul said in the book of Romans, because men, when they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do things that are not convenient. We are living in the days of great deception where people have rejected God. They've rejected the Bible. They put God out of our schools. They put God out of our uh, parliament chambers. They put God out of our state houses. They put God out of our public squares. They've taken down the Ten Commandments. They have become enemies of Jesus Christ. They're tearing down crosses. They're burning churches all over the world. And that's bad news. And these are signs of the times. Jesus talked about earthquakes in diverse places. He said there's be signs in the heavens. And just on and on and on. And we know there are many other prophecies. And I teach all the Daniel prophecies. I teach the book of Revelation. There are prophecies in Zechariah, in Haggai, in Zephaniah, in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. There are prophecies all over the Bible about what's going to happen in the last days. And Jesus said, all of these things are going to be fulfilled in one generation. You know, in, in a roundabout way, you might say that the prophecies themselves have enslaved us because we are caught in a net, and it's called the last generation. You and I are caught in God's net. This is the last generation, and there is no way out of it. 
You can't escape the Bible prophecies. We're living in a day when massive, massive spiritual deceptions are underway. We have a new Christianity coming on the scene that is all about human potential and self-fulfillment and success and prosperity and wealth and personal happiness. And it has absolutely nothing to do with the kingdom of God. And I want to remind you something. That Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. I'm here to tell you that the kingdom of God is the only thing that really matters to us. And this... this success and prosperity message that Christians are taking on right now, it does not build the kingdom of God. It builds the personal whims of men. We're, we're living in a day when Christianity is teaching people to dream big dreams, to name it and claim it, to get your blessing now. You can be all that you want to be. We've got everything from Joel Osteen to Joyce Myers, Kenneth Copeland, after the tradition of Kenneth Hagin and all the other word of faith preachers, so-called word of faith preachers. And I want to tell you where that comes from. That goes back, way back. We've been hearing this, we've been hearing this stuff. It's, and nowadays there's another school of thought. It's called the law of attraction. You're going to hear a lot about that. The law of attraction. Oprah Winfrey, Oprah Winfrey and her book, The Secret, and her compatriot, Eckhart Tolle, wrote a book about basically about the law of attraction, where you can have anything you want, where whatever you speak you can have. And there are certain parallels in the law of attraction and the secret and some of these modern New Age guru teachings and the teachings of Christ, because Jesus himself taught that if you can believe, you can receive. And he said, whatever you ask, you shall receive. And whatever you seek, you will find. And whatever you knock, the door will be open to you. But the difference between Jesus' teaching and this new positivism, this new positive thinking, this new law of attraction, is that it, the, the law of attraction and all these other things have nothing to do with the kingdom of God. They don't build the kingdom of God. They build the will of men. And it's the same kind of thing that Lucifer did when he said, I will... Ascend into the heavens. I will be like the Most High. I will exalt myself above the stars of God. I will sit in the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north. I will, I will, I will, I will. And it was totally contrary to God's will. Now you have to understand a man or a woman who's willing to do God's will has unspeakable blessings promised to him or her. If you are willing to comply with the gospel of Jesus Christ, you can have anything you need. This Bible says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. But that is based on your having put the kingdom of God as your number one priority. If you don't put the kingdom as your number one priority, then your personal whims are going to lead you off into estrangement from Almighty God in this life and in eternity, condemnation in hell. And we're seeing our entire world getting further and further and further from the kingdom of God. The gospel of Jesus Christ has been contaminated. It has been corrupted. It has been changed. You can take it all the way back generations ago, back in the 1800s. The occultists, Madam Helen Blavatsky and uh, occultist Aleister Crowley, they began to talk in these terms. And then in, in later years, in the early 1900s, you had people like Earl Nightingale and, and, uh, and uh, Napoleon Hill and, and Norman Vincent Peale and the power of positive thinking and so many of their, of their kind. They began to teach us that all you have to do, the mind of man, whatever the mind of man can believe and conceive, he can receive. And it had nothing to do with God. It all has to do with this so-called law of attraction and so on, so that people can have anything they want and it has no pre-qualifications based on scriptures. But I'm going to tell you something. If you want to live forever in the kingdom of God, you can't practice all these other spiritual laws. You've got to comply with the gospel of Jesus Christ first. 
Now, man, I've really jumped into a deep hole to preach to you here today, and, and a whole lot needs to be said, and I'm not going to take all the time to explore all the avenues I really could in this subject, but I'm telling you, we're living in a day of spiritual corruption. We're living in a day when the church itself is under siege. Just like Israel is surrounded. When you go to Israel today, on the northwest is Lebanon with 200,000 missiles pointed at it. On the northeast is Syria with 150, 200,000 Iranian missiles pointed at it. On the east is Jordan and Iraq with missiles and Iranian terrorists all over that. On the south and west, you've got uh, has you've got Hamas and the Gaza Strip and Egypt down there. Israel is under siege. And they've threatened Israel and said, if you get us in a war, we're going we're gonna to burn you down. And for what it's worth, just in the, in, the, in the last two days' news, there are fires going on all over Israel. And they, the news headline says because of the heat wave that's come through there, but it's only been about two weeks ago when the Palestinians said publicly, we're going to burn this place down. So it's going to get really hot in Israel if, we, if this peace plan doesn't get what we want. And we know the peace plan is not going to give them what they want. And now we're seeing all these wildfires all over Israel. And you can believe there's terrorism behind some of them for sure. Israel is under siege. America is under siege. The president is under siege. Conservatives are under siege. Capitalists are under siege. The church is under siege. Preachers are under siege. Christians are under siege. Do you realize that they said that 90% of all of our media is owned by six corporations, and those six corporations all are under the auspices of Nathan Rothschild, who is part of the New World Order. Now, you'd have to believe that if you don't want to, but I'm telling you, our news is is being slanted to produce what Big Brother wants us to have. Our minds, you hear me, our minds are under siege. My mind is under siege. Your mind is under siege. But it's more than our minds, it's our soul. This is a war. This is a demonic war. This is a hellacious war. This is a spiritual war between heaven and hell. It's a war between Satan and Jesus Christ. It's a war between all the forces, the godless forces of Lucifer and the church of Jesus Christ. The church is under siege because we're living in the last days. That last generation Jesus talked about began in May of 1948 when David Ben-Gurion and the Israeli people made their declaration of independence in the state of Israel born. And this is now the 71st year of the last generation. And for a godless man or a woman, that's bad news because I'm going to tell you where we're headed. We're headed for the last few events on God's prophetic calendar. We're headed for the last seven years that are taught in the ninth chapter of the book of Daniel, verses 24 to 27. Seven years during which the Roman Catholic Church is effectively going to take side with the Palestinians when they confirm a covenant with many for one week. I suppose that's what that means. We're going to see the third temple built. And you know that's going to cause lots and lots of trouble. We're going to see the Assyrian man of sin walk into that temple and commit what Daniel and Jesus Christ and Paul called the abomination of desolation. Man of sin, Paul called him. We're going to see that will, that will be the trigger of the great tribulation. At the very same time that a Syrian man of sin stands up in that third temple in Jerusalem in the middle of those seven years, Jesus said Jerusalem is going to be surrounded by armies. That's bad news. That man of sin is bad news. That pope confirming a covenant is bad news. And when that man of sin confirms, when that man of sin commits that abomination, it's at the very same time that the pope unveils the mark of the beast. And that's bad news. Because the Bible said he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark that no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark or the name or the number of his name. And then the next chapter says that those that do take the mark are going to be Condemned to hell by Jesus Christ. Bad news. 
42 months, Jesus said it's going to be great tribulation such as the world has never seen. No shall ever see. He said it's going to be worse than it has been since the beginning of the world of this time. No nor shall ever be. Bad news. <laughs> you, you think I like this? You think I'm a sadist? You think I'm a masochist? You think I'm a hater? You think I just love to make you depressed? I love to just make you feel bad, make you want to go blow your brains out? You think that's what I like? Do you know why I'm telling you what I'm telling you today? Because I know what the Bible says. And I know precious few people who understand what the Bible says. And I feel it's incumbent upon me, knowing what I know, I have to. I want to tell you about a, a story. There's a story in the book of Jeremiah, the 36th chapter. Jeremiah, you may know, was called the weeping prophet. The weeping prophet. Jeremiah was a weeping prophet because he lived in the last days of Israel in his day. The the nation of Israel had fallen apart when King Solomon died. Solomon had presided over the nation of Israel at its apex. In the early years of King Solomon's reign, Israel was larger than it had ever been, and it had more peace than it ever had had. But Solomon broke all the rules, and the Bible said he was not supposed to take, he was not supposed, Moses had taught all the way back in Deuteronomy that kings of Israel should not multiply wives unto themselves and that they should not multiply horses unto themselves, and that they should not multiply gold and silver unto themselves. And, and Solomon did all those things. He had, what was it, 700, uh, 400 wives and 700 concubines? And he had the largest collection of horses than probably any king in the, uh, to his day? And he was one of the wealthiest men that ever lived. And the Bible said because he married all these women who were from all kinds of pagan nations, they caused him to to fall into spiritual whoredoms where he began to worship their gods instead of the one true and living God. Solomon fell into idolatry. He fell into spiritual wickedness. He fell into spiritual corruption. And when he died, the kingdom split under his son Rehoboam and a man named Jeroboam. And the ten northern tribes of Israel went for many generations without one single righteous king until they were finally condemned by God and were sieged by the Assyrians and carried off into captivity and destroyed effectively, brought into dispersion. And only two tribes remained in Jerusalem. We call that Judah and Benjamin. And that small nation based in Jerusalem lived for several more generations with about a half a dozen righteous kings, men like Josiah and Hezekiah and others, until finally they apostatized as well and fell into sin. And the prophets began to tell them that judgment was coming. And judgment did come. And Jeremiah was there. There were three prophets alive at that time. Ezekiel was an older man. Daniel was a young boy, probably a young teenager. And Jeremiah was, suppose, a... a a middle-aged man. Ezekiel was carried off into Babylon into captivity, and the Bible said he prophesied from the river Chebar. We know that he was carried off into Babylon. We know that Daniel, everybody knows the story of Daniel, how he became a prince in, the, in uh, Nebuchadnezzar's household, and for 70 years Daniel served in a pagan empire as the present, first a president of Babylon and the president of Persia. But then Jeremiah was the one who was left behind because the Bible said that Jeremiah uh, had prophesied and preached and did everything in his power to get the people to repent of their sins so that judgment would not come and God would not send Nebuchadnezzar there, but they did not repent, and so God sent judgment. And when they came, they slaughtered multitudes of Jews there in the valleys around Jerusalem. They burned the city down, and they hauled the majority of them off in chains into Babylon. But the Bible says that the uh, general there, the leader of the Babylon army, picked out Jeremiah and told him, he said, if you want to stay here, if you want to go with us, we will treat you well in Babylon. But if you want to stay here, we'll let you stay here. And Jeremiah chose to stay there with a remnant 
of people. The, the Babylonians had decided they wanted to leave a small number of people there to till the land, to cultivate the land. There were vineyards and, and farmlands in there. They didn't want all this to grow up and go to waste. So by the will of God, the Babylonians left a remnant in Jerusalem, and Jeremiah was allowed to stay there. And they also chose a man named Gedaliah to become the governor of that new group of people, the remnant. And so it looked like that the blessing of God was on Jeremiah and that those people who had been left behind were going to be able to live in peace. But for some reason, we don't know all the reasons why, there's a story there in the uh, probably about the 35th to the 40th chapters. I forget exactly what. It's about five or six chapters. It's a quite a long story where there was an uprising there against the governor, against Gedaliah. It was led by a man named Ishmael, not the same Ishmael that was the son of Abraham back yonder, but this was another Ishmael, and he had a band of thugs with him, and they had determined they were going to kill Gedaliah for whatever reasons. And there was somebody that had that was savvy to that, and they went privately to Jeremiah and warned him, said, there's people out here that's getting ready to kill you. And Gedaliah didn't believe them. He sloughed it all and said, no, they're not going to do that. And surely enough, Ishmael and his thugs killed the governor of Jerusalem who was left there to take care of the remnant. And that sent panic. I've got a lot to say to you. I want you to stay and pay attention to me because i got a real message for you here. That sent panic throughout the remnant. Those Jews that had been left behind, they had been consoled for the time being, knowing that God had left Jeremiah and Gedaliah there in charge and they were going to be able to live there and toil the land and, and do okay. But when Gedaliah was murdered, the people freaked out. They freaked out because their governor was dead, murdered. And they went to Jeremiah the prophet and said to Jeremiah, Please go to God and pray for us and get a word from the Lord. We need to know what to do. We don't know what to do. And they told Jeremiah, said, if you'll pray for us, we promise you whatever the Lord tells us that we need to do, that's what we'll do. So Jeremiah went and prayed. He spent 10 days, the Bible said, for 10 days Jeremiah stayed alone with the Lord, and the Lord gave him a word for the people. And he came back to the people and said, I have a word from the Lord for you. And he told him, he said, God says, in effect, if you'll stay here in the land, if you'll be at peace, if you'll cooperate with the Babylonians, then they're going to treat you well, and God's going to give you strength here, and God's going to help you plant a root here, and you're going to grow up and multiply, and you're going to make a good comeback. God, In other words, God promised to bless these people if they would just be calm and, and, and be restful and stay there and cooperate and be at peace. But there was a second part to Jeremiah's answer from the Lord, and that is, but if you don't stay here like I'm telling you to stay here, but if you get afraid and you go down to Egypt thinking you're going to go down to Egypt and be safe in Egypt, he said, I'm warning you now, if you go to Egypt... I will destroy you in Egypt. Now remember this. The remnant had told Jeremiah, whatever the Lord tells you, we're going to do it. We promise you we're going to do it. And so Jeremiah got a word from the Lord, and he told them what the Lord said. And you know what they did? They got scared. They panicked. And they fled to Egypt. You want me to tell you worse than that? There's more bad news to that story. It wasn't just the remnant that fled to Egypt. You want me to tell you a little secret? The prophet Jeremiah went with them. You think about that. Jeremiah backslid. Because the Bible says that once they all got down to Egypt, the Babylonians came. And they took Egypt and they took the Jews and destroyed them. Because the word of the Lord said, if you go down to Egypt, I'm going to destroy you there. And here's the message, folks. I don't care how bad the news is. God Almighty has a plan for his people. And it is a plan to bless his people, even in the midst of the greatest, most 
unimaginable trial of your lifetime. God wants to sustain you and help you and give you rest. I'm going to give you one more story before I go on, and that's concerning King Saul. Now, you know, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt and went through the wilderness, and finally Joshua brought them across Jordan into the promised land, Joshua led them for about 40 years, and then Samuel, the prophet, led them for about 40 years. And then the people began to cry for a king. They wanted a king. They wanted a king. And Samuel told them, said, you don't need a king. God is your king. No, we want a king like everybody else has. And Samuel said, you're going to be sorry. He's going he's to be hard on you. You're going to regret asking for a king. We want a king anyway, they said. And so God gave them Saul. You remember Saul, don't you? Samuel went and anointed Saul, and Saul became the king, and he was a pretty good guy for a while. But the Bible said there was a couple of incidents that took place that was really bad. Some bad news took place. One happened to do with an incident where Saul was going to have to take his armies into a battle with the enemy. And the prophet Samuel said, Now you, you guys go down here and, and, and meet me at a certain place out in the field. And I'm going to come over and we're going to make a sacrifice to the Lord and I'm going to pray before you go to battle. So Saul took his troops out into the field and they waited on Samuel. And Samuel didn't come at the designated time. And so Saul freaked out. He panicked. I got, I got a preaching message for you if you'll stay with me. Saul panicked because the prophet wasn't there on time. And so... He took it upon himself to build the altar and make the sacrifice and make the prayer. Even though he was not the prophet in Israel. He was not the spiritual guru. He was not the spiritual leader. Samuel was the spiritual leader. But Saul offended God by that move. And when Samuel the prophet got there and saw that Saul had been impatient, Paul had been afraid and moved forward without a mind of God. Samuel rebuked him and said, God's going to take the kingdom from you for this. And that wasn't the end of the matter because down the line, in Samuel's old age, he died and left Saul without a counselor. And when Samuel died, Saul really freaked out this time. And you remember the story. He told his son Jonathan, he said, I need... I need to talk to Samuel. John said, well, Samuel's dead, Daddy. He said, well, go get me the witch of Ender. And he couldn't believe his ears. Because Israel had always been taught from the days of Moses, don't ever consult with the witches. and Don't ever consult with the familiar spirit. These things are evil, and God doesn't want you to involve with these evil spirits. And even knowing that, Saul said, I want the witch of Ender. And so they, got, they fetched the witch of Ender. And she purported to pull up the spirit of Samuel, which is not the spirit of Samuel. It was, a, it was a familiar spirit. Demons can't call holy men of God back from the grave. If you believe that, you've got a real problem. <clears throat> that spirit said, you're going to die today. Now, purporting to be Samuel, it said, you're going to be with me this time tomorrow indicating his death but the fact is Saul was not with Samuel the next day he was in hell Saul didn't die a saint he died a sinner Samuel died a saint so that spirit that told Saul that he'd be with him the next day was a demon spirit be that as it may my point is this there was lots and lots of bad news in Saul's day, and he didn't, he didn't handle it well. He didn't do right. He lost his kingdom, and he lost his eternal soul because he panicked. He freaked out in hard times. I want to talk to you about that. We live in one of the most difficult times the world has ever known. Jesus said we're fixing to go through the Great Tribulation. If you don't believe that, then go find another video to watch. We're fixing to go through the Great Tribulation. We're not going to be raptured out of here before the Tribulation. Go watch my video on YouTube channel about the post-Tribulation rapture. 
and prove this over and over and over and over again, there is no rapture before the Great Tribulation. Now here's the, here's the thing. If you panic in these hard times, if you panic in the midst of all this bad news, you're going to be destroyed. If you don't learn to trust God and follow God and obey God, even in the most difficult spiritual times the world's ever known, then you're probably not going to be saved. If you want to be saved, you're going to have to learn how to trust God. I want to talk to you about this for a minute. And I've, I've talked some of these things in previous videos, but I really want to hammer on here tonight. Jesus said, John 14, 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If we're not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Let not your heart be troubled. He said that again later on in the 14th chapter of John. Twice he said, let not your heart be troubled. Paul said in the book of Hebrews, there is a rest for the children of God. And he said, Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being given us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to fall short. Say rest. Now we have a big controversy with the Seventh-day Adventists because they all demand that we celebrate the Sabbath or keep the Sabbath according to the Old Testament. And we don't do it because we understand that the New Testament rest is not the seventh day of the week, but it is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Jesus told his early church, he said, I will not leave you comfortless. I want you to get a hold of that. Jesus said it to the apostles and he says it to you and me this day. God Almighty says, by the words of Jesus Christ, I will not leave you comfortless. I don't care how bad the news is. We have a comforter in Jesus Christ. The spirit that those 120 disciples received in the upper room on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem on Mount Zion, that was the spirit of Jesus Christ. That was the comforter. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And when they received the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, Jesus was coming to them. Jesus came to them on the day of Pentecost. When they received the Holy Ghost, that was the spirit of Christ. And Paul said, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If you don't get that spirit, you do not have the comforter. If you don't get the Spirit of Christ, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking with other tongues, all your law of attraction is not going to save you. All your secret doctrines is not going to save you. Oprah Winfrey is not going to save you. Uh, Tony Robbins is not going to save you. And all these positive guys, Joel Osteen and Joyce Myers and all their positive thinking is not going to save you. God Almighty didn't put you in here to indulge your carnal desires until the end of your life. He put you in here to do the will of God. God Almighty wants you to keep his commandments and walk according to his word and do his will and seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Not seek your own, not your own dreams and visions, but his dreams and visions. And if you'll do that, he promises to bless and keep you. And that's kind of like what God told them in Jeremiah's day. You stay where I put you. You bloom where I have planted you. And you be at peace with this. You and I have to learn how to be at peace with the bad news. I have to learn. Because I study news a whole lot more than a lot of you do. I read bad news all day, every day. It, it just about drives me crazy to see what's happening in our country and in our world. But I want to know because I want to keep, I want to keep watching the clock because Jesus is coming. And I want to know when. But the more bad news I see, the more I know that I have to rest in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, my peace I give unto you. I want you to say that. My peace. Whose peace? The peace that Jesus had. Do you think Jesus had peace? 
I want you to find me one story in this Bible where Jesus didn't have peace. Now, I know that he made a little whip and he scourged those evil guys in the temple. I don't think he was, I don't think he lost his peace. I think he was a righteous God Almighty driving filthiness out of the temple. The most upset I really ever saw Jesus was in Gethsemane when he was sweating as it was great drops of blood. And all that was was the human fight or flight. It was the, you know, it's that defense mechanism that's inborn and inbred into our bodies. None of us wants to die. Jesus was struggling with the sentence of death that was on him. But he didn't let it get him because the Bible said at the end he finally said, Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And he reconciled himself to the will of God. And he willingly went to the cross for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross and despised the shame. And now he's set on the throne of God. So I'm talking about the peace of Jesus Christ. My peace. The peace of Jesus Christ is the peace that you see. I'm going to show you what it is. The peace of Jesus Christ is the ability to sleep in a little boat on a wildly stormy sea. I want you to imagine that. Imagine yourself in a small boat with a dozen men in a wild thunderstorm with the waves thrashing that boat around. Those men were scared out of their wits. They woke Jesus up said, Master, carest thou not that we perish? He said, Oh, ye of little faith. And then the Bible said he, he got up and he rebuked the storm and immediately it ceased. The peace of Jesus Christ enabled him to sleep. Think about it. He was sleeping in that small boat in the midst of a crazy storm. That's my peace. That's the peace of Jesus Christ. And he said, I give that to you. He said, I give you that ability to sleep in a terrible storm. I give you the ability to rest when all around you is bad news. When you are literally under siege with bad news. I give you my peace. My peace I give you. Not like the world gives. The world can't give you that kind of peace. The world can't give it to you because the world doesn't have it. The world does not have that peace. Do you know the world's in turmoil today because people are going crazy? My peace. And the Bible said it's the peace that passes all understanding. And it is... It is colleague to all the virtues it's it's a colleague to faith it's a it's it's a a colleague to hope to all positive expectation i'm not dreaming of driving a rolls royce or a lamborghini i'm not dreaming of living in a million dollar palace with an olympic sized swimming pool i'm dreaming of doing the will of god and as long as I'm dreaming of doing the will of God, and as long as my expectation is that I will do his will, I can expect that when I need food, there's going to be food on the table. When I need drink, there's going to be drink. And if you don't believe that, go back and see how God took care of them. There was always bread, and there was always water, and there was always shoes on their feet. And for 40 years, God took care of them, even though they were scallywags, even though over and over and over again, they grieved his Holy Spirit, yet God continued to take care of them and bless them. And Jesus said, consider the lilies of the field, how they toil not, neither do they spin. Yet Solomon in all of his splendor was not arrayed like one of these. And he said, give no thought for your lives, what you shall eat or what you shall drink. I'm talking about peace. Peace. In the midst of a siege. Peace in the midst of a storm. Peace in the midst of nothing but bad news. Peace. And that's what the kingdom of God is. Paul said the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, which is not material things, but it is 
righteousness and peace and joy. Joy in a storm. Joy under siege. Joy when there is nothing but bad news. I guess I have to come to the conclusion that it is not all bad news. The fact is, the bad news is good news. For we know that all things work together for the good to them who love God and who are the called according to his purpose. The good news is that this last period of tribulation leads us to the second coming of Jesus Christ. The bad news, the mark of the beast, the sixth trumpet war, the battle of Armageddon, the great tribulation, all the bad news you can think about or talk about leads us to our salvation. Because Zechariah said at evening time, there shall be light. Just as it seems it can't get any darker, the sun is going to shine again. Jesus said, except those days be shortened, listen to me, except those days be shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And I don't know all that means, but I can tell you this, Jesus is going to come. You've all heard the old saying that says, he may not come when you want him, but he'll always be there right on time. And God's going to save you and me that puts our trust in him. Let us therefore fear lest the promise being given us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to fall short. Don't fall short of the rest. Don't fall short of entering into his rest. Don't fall short of of taking the peace of God into your bosom. Don't fall short of trusting. This Bible said, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. I'm here to tell you there's not a trial that you will ever go through that God Almighty will not go with you. When you go through the flood, it's not going to overflow you. When you go through the fire, it's not going to burn you. God Almighty, they said the day that they chopped off Paul's head, God crowned it in glory. And I'm pretty sure that's true. And the day you die for Jesus Christ is the day your battle's over. And when the battle's over, we shall wear a crown in that new Jerusalem. Peace, joy, righteousness in the Holy Ghost. Don't you want it? Why don't you claim it right now in Jesus' name? The bad news is good news. And that's my message to you tonight. I thank you for joining me. Appreciate you being with me tonight. I hope you'll go to Amazon.com and check out all my books. The Bible Companions 2 volume. Volume 1 is the Old Testament. Volume 2 is the New Testament. Teaches you step-by-step -step lessons for, through the entire Bible, Genesis, Revelation. It's a great companion to put beside your easy chair or your, or your bedside. The Daniel Prophecies, 726 pages that will explain virtually every major prophecy subject in the Bible to you. A book on prayer there, a book on the greatest doctrines of the Bible, a book, newest, my newest book called Treasures of Darkness, How to See the Glory of God in your darkest trials. That kind of goes with what I've been preaching here tonight. You need that book, Treasures of Darkness. Check that out. If you'd like to get this whole set at a discounted price, and I'll pay the shipping, you can buy all nine books for $125, but you have to use the link below this video. It's not available. That special is not available at Amazon. You can't get it for $125 at Amazon. Get all nine books, including the shipping, for $125. That's only in those of you that's in North America. I can't do this if you're outside the country. The shipping's too expensive. So if you're in if you're in the U.S., you want to get all nine books for $125. Just follow the link below here. Also, we'll take a tour to Israel every year in November. 
Check out my website at kenradjo.com. Sign up for the free daily Bible studies by email. I send out one email a day. It has four mini Bible lessons. You can read those daily in your email box. Also, while you're at my website study, there's thousands and thousands of pages of free Bible studies there. Also, you can uh, see my tour page, The True to Israel. Also, in May of 2020, I'm taking a prophecy cruise to Alaska. I'll be teaching prophecy lessons every night on board the Norwegian Joy. And by day, we'll be visiting Ketchikan, Juneau, the Icy Fields, and uh, Victoria, British Columbia. It's going to be a great seven-day vacation, and we'll learn a lot of Bible, a lot of Bible prophecies while on that trip. It'll be a great trip. Check that out, too. Thanks again for joining me. Come back every time we're here, and I'll see you next time. Tell your friends, and we'll see you next time. God bless you. Thank you.